So in previous video, we introduced the steps of the standard strategy and we looked at this example one. And I ended the video by noting that in this simple example, it's possible to think of an intuitive way to solve it and that would be quicker than standard strategy. Where the standard strategy shines are the more difficult questions. So take this example of example 2, taken from question 9-5 from the portable TA. So it asks, blocks A and B sit on top of each other. They are attached by these ropes. It says block B is heavier than block A. Uh, and it says block A is so slippery that it slides frictionlessly on block B. Okay, uh, let me note that in the drawing. But the coefficient of kinetic friction between block B and ramp is mu. Okay, and it asks, assuming block B accelerates down the ramp after it is released, what is its acceleration? And also, what is the tension in the rope? Oh, I think they are supposed to give us the masses of the blocks. So let me label mass of the block A and mass of block B. And the drawing also shows the angle theta of the incline. Now, this is the kind of question if we are trying these one-step guesses, like acceleration is equal to g sine theta, or the tension is, I don't know, mg sine theta, and any combinations of these, m, m a, g sine theta, m, b, g sine theta or ma plus mb none of these are correct answers of course i think <laughs> so this is where intuitive approach hits its limit the situation is more complicated there are infinite different things that you could guess as an answer and the chances are your guess won't be the right answer and this is the exact scenario that is made for standard strategy. So let's uh, work through the standard strategy. Let me start out with step one, drawing the free body diagrams. This system has uh, two blocks. So I'm going to need uh, two free body diagrams, one for each object. So I'll draw one diagram for the block A and a separate diagram for block B. Each of these diagrams will illustrate the forces on the block and just on the block. Let me start with the A. So there must be gravity on block A of MAG. And since it's touching this surface here, I can say it has normal force from the surface. MA, I'm subscripting it because I'm anticipating a lot of normal forces. I want to make sure I don't get them confused. Um, with these two forces, the potential direction of acceleration is in the wrong direction because I got the impression that block B will be accelerating down the ramp, which means block A should be accelerating up the ramp. Oh, oh, I see. There's this string connected here, so there must be tension force on block A. And this tension force, which goes along the incline of the ramp, must be large enough so that when you add up all the forces, the direction of acceleration will be up the slope. Okay, that's block A. Let me do block B. So block B looks quite similar to block A in terms of forces that could be acting on it. So there must be gravity on block B and normal force from the surface is touching and tension force that's uh, again pulling it up the slope. But here we think it will be accelerating downward so oh so here the weight must be greater so i think we can make that work oh and we have friction force here so while it's sliding down the slope also accelerating down the way you figure out the direction of friction is direction of friction will always be the direction that prevents the sliding between surfaces so you first figure how will the surfaces slide against each other without friction and friction is always introduced to, to make less of that happen. 
So here, the friction force will be up the slope. Now, at this point, a common mistake to make is to think that this is the complete free body diagram and do the rest of the problem solving based on this diagram. And then you will get some answer and it will be slightly off. This is why step number one is the step that takes the most consideration, care, and time. And you really need to ask the question, did I draw all the forces? And I've been doing that. I've been introducing forces for gravity, and I've been introducing the contact forces for things that are touching the blocks. And here's one last check to do to make sure that you catch anything that you might have missed as you're doing that. And this is what I would like to call Newton's third law check. This is a check that you only need to do when you have multiple objects in your system because you are checking for internal forces. So for each of the forces that we have drawn, we have to ask this question, is this force being exerted by something that's uh, internal to our system? the blocks that we are drawing, A and B, or is it external to the system? Usually, a lot of forces will be external. So both the gravitational forces are external. They come from Earth. Earth is not part of our system. And even the tension force is external. You can look at that as a force being exerted by the strings, which are external. Or even if you think of string as connecting the blocks to this pulley, well, the pulley is external as well. Okay, uh, four forces down, three to go. Um, now, we have these forces, the normal force on block B and the friction force. So again, you have to think about where the force comes from. It comes from this surface of contact. So it's the ramp that's exerting those contact forces, the normal force and the friction force. And since we are not considering ramp to be part of our system, they are both external forces. Which finally brings us to this point, the normal force on block A. It's coming from this surface of contact. So which object is exerting this force, Na? You can see that it must be block B that's exerting that force. So Newton's third law says whenever block B exerts a force on block A by amount Na, then there must be a force on block B by block A. That's equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. And looking at my free body diagram for block B, I don't think I see that. I see this normal force, but that's an entirely different thing. And I don't see any other normal force. So I got to draw that. Let me make some room. So what I need is a normal force that goes in the opposite direction of Na, drawn on free body diagram for A, and equally magnitude. So, oh, I guess I can use the same symbol, Na, to indicate that. And in fact, if you are doing the check of did I draw all the forces more thoroughly, you could have gotten this maybe without explicitly invoking Newton's third law. Because as you are considering block B, you could have noticed that block A is touching block B. So you could have figured there must be a normal force that's pushing down on block B. Now, the additional thing that Newton's third law does give you is that the magnitude of the normal force is something that we have already introduced in our free body diagram. So that's the complete step one. We have drawn all the forces and we have done this Newton's third law check to make sure that we didn't miss any forces of interaction. So now we are moving on to step number two. That's the defining of the coordinate axis. We've already identified the direction of acceleration. So let me define my coordinate axis that way. So that actually means I'm going to have this direction be positive x for block A. And I'm actually going to flip the x direction around for block B 
because the acceleration for block B goes the other way. So let me label my axis as this downward direction is plus X. And let's make the Y same as the block A. You don't have to define your axis this way, especially if you feel positive X going to the left looks weird. But if you don't define the axis this way, you have to be so much more careful in writing down the expression for acceleration. I think at this stage, you will save a lot of trouble for yourself if you define your positive x-axis along the direction of acceleration, even when it's not the usual direction you would have chosen to be positive. Okay, that's step number two. Step number three is breaking down forces into components. And I see that for both of the free body diagrams, the one force I need to break down into components is the gravity. So let me draw the component, the X component, and the Y component here. And similarly, oh, let me move this B around again. Gravitational force on B has X and Y components as well. Okay, here the given angle theta is this angle here. That's the theta of the incline. And I will leave the geometry up to you to prove that it's this angle here that has the same value as theta. I do highly recommend that you get practice now so that when you have to do this for other questions, as you surely will have to sometime in the semester, that uh, you can do it correctly 100% of the time. Okay, I think that's enough. Um, I will write down the magnitudes of these components as I'm writing down Newton's second law equations. Um, these diagrams already look very crowded. For my step number four, this is the final step in standard strategy. We'll write down Newton's second law equations. And you write down Newton's second law equation for every object in your system. So I'm going to be writing down net force on block A is equal to mass times acceleration of A and net force on block B is equal to mass times acceleration of block B. And once again, these vector notations serve as a reminder that this one equation actually stands for all the related equations for different components. So let me just uh, go through each line, writing down each of the four equations that I will be needing. Let me start from A in the x direction. So I have net force on A in x direction is OK. I'm looking at this free body diagram here for A. Um, I have tension force in the x direction, and I have the x component of the gravitational force. So tension force is going in the positive direction, and I'm using the convention where I try to indicate the directions in my equation so that all the symbols will be a positive value. So it's a minus for the negative direction. The side I see here it's opposite to the angle that we figured out is theta. So the x component here must be mag sine theta. That's equal to ma times acceleration. OK, let's keep going. Net force for a again, but in the y direction. So net force on a in y direction is equal to uh, I have two forces, again, along the y direction. I have the normal force entirely in the y direction minus the y component of gravity, m a g cosine theta. I'm looking at how this side is adjacent to the angle theta. And in the y direction, the block doesn't accelerate. That's sort of the point of how we are choosing the coordinate axis. So this is equal to zero. All right, we are halfway done. I have to write down similar equations for block B. So it's going to be net force on block B in the x direction is equal to, um, oh, here I have to be careful. My positive axis was defined to be this direction here. So let me write down the x component of gravity first. That's mbg sine theta. 
And I have two other forces along the x direction, friction and tension. So that minus friction force and minus the tension force. That net force is equal to mass of B times acceleration. And it's the same acceleration, so we'll use the same symbol. We have one more equation. That is the net force on B in the y direction. That's equal to, uh, I got more forces again. I have the normal force from this inclined plane. Uh, let me write it down as positive NB. And I have the reaction force from the block A that's going in the negative y direction. So minus NA. And finally, we have the y component of the gravitational force. And again, given this angle theta, the y component is the adjacent side. So it's minus mbg cosine theta. And that's again equal to zero. Okay, uh, let me leave the solution steps for your practice. Let me just verify that you have all the information necessary to solve for the given information. So, so this is a general rule in algebra. For you to be able to solve a system of equations, you need equal numbers of unknowns and equations. So we have four equations. So I'm hoping to find that we have four unknowns. Let's check. So we have tension force that we don't know. Uh, mass, I'm going to assume that we know. G is a constant we know. Theta, I will assume that it's a given quantity. Because the question doesn't say we don't know that. <laughs> um, oh, but we won't know the acceleration because we are being asked. So we must not know it. Okay, two unknowns so far. I have the normal force on A. That's unknown. And no additional unknowns here. On equation 3. I have the mass, I'm going to assume I know that. Friction force, I don't know. And let's know where am I given the expression for friction force. Tension, I still don't know. I already counted it, so I won't count it a second time. Here, it might take a little bit of work showing that these two tension forces are the same. One statement in the question that does a lot of that work is this phrase, massless, frictionless pulley. If either of these are not right, then yeah, the tension could be different. But here, they are the same. Acceleration, I don't know, but we already counted that. Let's go into equation 4. And actually, before we do that, you can see that we will need equation 4. Because so far, we've looked at three equations, and we have four unknowns. So in equation 4, we have NB that we don't know. Okay, that's not looking good. Uh, NA, we don't know, but we already counted it. And the rest, we already counted it. All right, so we have four equations and five unknowns. That does mean we are missing something. And this is where you have to maybe reread the question and make sure that you have reflected all the given information um, into your mathematical expressions here. And one piece of information that we did not use is the fact that the question gave coefficient of kinetic friction. And part A explicitly says, assuming block B accelerates down. So we are in a kinetic situation that makes the formula for friction forces much simpler. And we'll have a separate video where we talk about friction with all the nuances. For the purpose of this question, all you have to know is that the friction force, that is the kinetic friction force, is given by the coefficient of kinetic friction times the normal force. That is the normal force between the surfaces where the friction is acting. So in this new equation, you can see that the friction force is something that we already counted as an unknown. So no new unknown there. We were given the coefficient of friction. So that's good. And oh, the normal force here should be the NB, normal force between block B and the ramp. So now we do have five equations and five unknowns. So we, or you, should be able to solve this equation for two of those five unknowns, eliminating the other three. And before we move on, 
it's in this equation where you can see that if we had missed out on this normal force Na, the expression for Nb based on equation 4 will be different and that'll result in discrepancy which uh, in this case is error because not including this force would have been wrong. And there are other complications I can mention, but I think I'm already having you do enough on your own, so let me leave that there. For example three, let me come back to example one and make it interesting. So this was our example one, and this is how I propose to make it interesting. So as example three, make it block on sliding inclined plane. So before I drew my inclined plane as some immovable thing, let's say it's its own block and its surfaces are so frictionless that it's uh, able to slide freely on this uh, horizontal table. Let me give it a mess begin. And here the one thing I can tell you is that the acceleration of this small block will no longer be A. So let's fully explore all the changes that we will now have to make. So let me copy this down the page so that I have more space. So the one change is we will have to draw an additional free body diagram because this uh, ramp will be able to move as well we have to consider how its motion will be affecting everything else. So we need a free body diagram of M, capital M. So there's going to be gravity on the block, like with uh, everything else. Now it's not accelerating downward, so there must be something that's opposing this gravitational force. Oh, and that'll be the normal force from this surface down here. Let me label that N2. Now, this is where you have to consider carefully how will this uh, sliding block now move. And I hope after giving it some thought, you will end with a conclusion that if it's going to accelerate in any direction, it will accelerate to the left. And this is one of the complications because this acceleration will not be the same as the other acceleration. So let me give it a different label. And considering this acceleration, I hope you see that this free body diagram is incomplete. It only has forces in the vertical directions. It doesn't have any forces in the horizontal direction. So where could we get those horizontal direction force? And I hope you find it after a while. If it helps, you can do the Newton's third law check. And in doing Newton's third law check, you should find that this normal force is now an internal force because it's a normal force exerted by the ramp of mass big M. And now this is part of our system. So we should find the reaction force pair on the ramp and it's the 180 degrees from the direction of n on the small mass n. So let me just draw this auxiliary figure to correctly indicate the direction. Now, at this step, those of you who are working ahead might look at this situation and think, hmm, what has really changed for my free body diagram for the small mass m? because it might look like all the forces that were there before are still here. Gravity is still there, normal force is still there, still no friction force. So you might think, doesn't that mean neither of these two equations change and the result that we derived before still hold? You might think of that. And what you have to be careful is this. If this ramp is able to accelerate to the left, when you consider the acceleration of the small block M, it is still down the incline, as in the direction of acceleration of small block M will be parallel 
to this surface here. And I hope you find that that's not the case here. So what changes in this free body diagram are not the forces, and it's not as they are represented, but the direction of acceleration. Instead of being parallel to the incline, it will be in some direction, some component parallel to incline, and some component perpendicular to incline. So maybe something like this will be the direction of acceleration. And I will tell you, uh, this is a difficult question. And I don't know if I would even recommend keeping this the same set of axes. This is one of those situations where the problem solving steps might be much cleaner if you just decided to use straight axis, x and y, and just to contend with there being x and y component of acceleration. It won't be pretty. And if you were to write down two additional equations that relate to the ramp of mass m, oh, and make sure to change this because uh, with the change of coordinate axis, how your force components are expressed will be different. And after finishing writing down the set of equations for the ramp, I think at least the axis for the ramp is easy. I think I can let this be the positive x direction so that the ramp will be accelerating in the positive x direction and it's not going to be accelerating in the vertical direction. So I'll be able to call this mass times A2, that's the label I started using, and net force in the y direction results in zero acceleration. Now, what I was saying was, after you finish writing down all these additional equations, I think you will find that you have more unknowns than equations. It goes to the fact that uh, deciding to handle two components of acceleration separately resulted in basically this additional unknown. So you have to write down an additional equation, maybe something relating to how these two things are to remain in contact, then there is some relationship between this acceleration as a vector quantity and this acceleration. I guess the idea here is that uh, the, the acceleration vector plus the A2 vector that results in some vector quantity, and this should still be at angle theta, that is, I said how this acceleration won't be along the slope of the incline. But if you correct for the fact that the ramp is moving, then the path that this uh, mass is going with the correction should be along that incline. Oh, oh, then I think this is not actually plus or but minus, looking at the figures. So you have to figure out a way to mathematically express that. That might be something like, <laughs> let me try to wing something here. I think I can do this. Uh, tangent of theta is equal to the y component over the x component of this resultant thing. So it would be something like a y over um, a y as labeled here, and I would need a x plus a two, both as positive quantities. So in graphical representation, something like this, the downward acceleration of AY and the rightward acceleration of AX plus the correction for the ramp moving, A2. This triangle should be similar to the triangle of the ramp, and this should be angle theta. So again, this is a difficult situation to work out, and I won't ever give you a question like this to do even on homework, because again, it's difficult. But you can see how the standard strategy lets you explore all these complications that arises from making this change. And for those of you who are inclined to tackle it, I do believe you have all the tools that you need to work through this system of five equations and get an answer. And this is possible using the systematic problem solving approach like the standard strategy. If you were to try to work through this intuitively 
uh, without a structured system, it's quite difficult to know what the next thing to do is. So let me end the examples here. As I said in the other video, you will see a lot more examples of application of the standard strategy about two dozen times just on me working through your homework questions. So if these three examples left you with some questions, watch out for those other videos working through your homework questions and see if you can follow. Like we do all physics problem solving, the Newton's law problem solving, the only way to get good at solving problems like these is through practice. So after watching these lecture videos, and reading through some of the portable T problems and solutions, I strongly recommend that you try working out the problems yourself without referring to any of these explanations that you might have looked at first. As you try to do these questions on your own, you will be able to figure out what you quite didn't get the first time around. And you can go back and look at the lecture videos or the portable TA again. Uh, find what you saw the first time but didn't quite understand and try the problem again. I strongly recommend this regime of practice. So with that, until next time, bye.